Hi, I want to thank you for checking out the Anchor Church podcast. I want to let you know about the Anchor Church app that you can find in the Apple and Google App Store. There you can find upcoming events, different things about our church, different ways to get involved, and also past messages. It's the best way to stay connected to everything that's going around Anchor. Also, at the bottom of this message, if it's your first time checking out Anchor, or you're a regular person that watches our messages online, there's a button that says Connect Card. We want you to hit that button, fill out the information. If you need prayer, if you just want to give us an update, or if it's your first time, it's the best way to stay connected. The second thing is, is if this message has impacted you, and you'd like to financially contribute to Anchor Church, there's a button that says Give. We would love for you to partner with us in everything that God is doing in the Toledo area right here at Anchor. Thank you so much, and we hope this message impacts you. All right, good morning. I didn't know if we were going to get out of that loop that was happening. We were just kind of stuck in it. But uh, how's everybody doing today? Yeah? Sun is out for the first time in like a month? Who's going to just like lay out in the sun today? Like doesn't even matter. Put a jacket on. <laughs> I was standing in the back. The sun was blasting through these back windows as we were getting ready this morning. Oh, there goes the light. And, uh, and uh, I was just standing there just like taking it in. Here, I'll fix it. There you go. It's the Holy Spirit, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but the sun is good, right? Like it is good. February, sun's out. No snow still. And uh, I was officiating a wedding on the other side of the state this weekend, and they were getting blasted. And as we got closer to Toledo last night, driving home, it just turned to rain. And I'm like, it may never be winter here. And uh, anybody excited about that? Shame on you. We love the snow. All right. Uh, (laughs) But I am excited this morning. Um, We are starting a new series and uh, man, I am so excited for this series. I think it's going to be powerful um, for our community, for your lives. This is a series I don't like. I'm not tooting my own horn. This is all God. This is a series you want to take notes in um, because there are going to be some promises in this series that I think are good reminders um, as you go through. I don't. I don't care who you are, how seasoned of a Christian you are, how not a Christian you are. Um, there are promises that are just good for your life that we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. So. Uh, Take notes in your phone. Uh, you can take notes on the app. Bring a notepad. Uh, I don't care. Get your kids to take notes if you don't like taking notes. Uh, find a kid and make them pay no- take notes for you. Pay them five bucks. They'll take notes for you. Um, but uh, this is going to be a good series. The series is titled Voices. The series, uh, Voices. And, and we're going to be talking about the different voices that, that kind of infiltrate our minds. And, and how do we navigate those voices? And so, uh, because life gets crazy, right? Anybody just, you've had a crazy couple of weeks? Anyone? Uh, sickness, maybe just busyness. We have had a crazy couple of weeks around my house. It has just been nonstop. It felt like it was never going to end. And, and when you're in those moments where it just feels like this is never going to end, right? Like it's never going to stop. Your mind starts getting weird on you, right? You start like thinking things like no one will ever be healthy again in my house, right? Like it's the black, it's what coronavirus, right? We got it, you know, and you're like freaking out. So you're like disinfecting everything. And when your mind starts running with stuff, uh, usually we get a little psychotic, right? We get weird. And uh, I remember when we first got married, you guys have heard me talk about our apartment when we lived in West Palm Beach, first got married, had no money. And, uh, but we were living the dream, young and married. And uh, we, we moved into our first apartment and there were cops cockroaches everywhere. Like this is how ghetto we were. Like we were not fancy back in the day. There were, we opened the cupboards. Like we hadn't even lived there yet. And just like anyone ever lived in the South where there's like real cockroaches and they just everywhere. And my wife, you know, I'm trying to be like new husband. Like I got it, babe. I'm going to get the cockroaches. And so I like got the traps and I got the spray and I got all the stuff. And these were psychotic cockroaches. They, there was nothing that could stop them. And how many, if you've been around cockroaches before uh, and, and you've had them in your house, uh, you have to seal everything. So you get like Tupperware containers or everything to seal it up. But, but the worst part about cockroaches isn't them running around your kitchen, isn't them like all over the place. It's when you go to bed at night, 
right? And you get into your bed and you pull the covers up and all, and you start feeling things. Anyone ever been like that? Or like a spider's been in your room and you're like, I know the spider's in my bed. And like the spider might not be in there at all, but like you start like feeling like things tickle on your leg and you're like, ah! And you're like freaking out. Like, like, man, we would go to bed at night and just be like, oh my gosh, there's cockroaches. They're in the bed. I know for sure. Like they were so bad. We moved into our apartment and then went on our honeymoon to the Bahamas. And there was a cockroach cockroach in our luggage in the Bahamas that came from our apartment. And so we would lay in bed at night and be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. And you're like itching your legs and you're moving all around. We ended up actually moving out of that apartment because we were like, we are not staying in here. I'm paying to live in Cockroachville. It's not happening. But, uh, but when you get in that situation where it just seems so crazy so much, your mind will literally begin to play tricks on you. You will convince your things that are illogical, right? Like we live in Ohio. Ohio and there's a little tiny daddy long leg in your room and you're like, there's a tarantula in here. I know it, right? My wife is terrified of spiders and uh, she has convinced my kids to be terrified of spiders. And I'm like, it's a little spider. What's it going to do to you? But you will convince your things all sorts of illogicalness. Your mind will play tricks on you. But there's also a, a strength to taking control of your mind. If you've ever been in a situation, if, if you can channel that, that mind, that, that attention the right way, it'll also convince you to do things that are completely illogical. I remember a few years ago, we were at a pool, and my kids um, didn't know how to swim yet, but they, uh, so they had their like little floaties, and they saw kids jumping off the side of the pool, right? And uh, I was like, Kara, you want to do that? Because Kara's my brave one. She's like the little tank. She'll just take you out. And uh, I'm like, Kara, you want to jump off the side of the pool? You want to get in there? You want to do this? And she was like, no, no, I'm terrified. Because think about this. I was thinking about this before service. We are the only creatures that dive in for fun to somewhere where we can't breathe at all, right? You don't see fish like hopping up on the beach and like, I'm going to hang out on the beach. I can't breathe up here. But we will, we will dive into a pool and see who can hold their breath the longest underwater. It is stupid. Like, and I love swimming, so I'm not criticizing, but I'm like, we, we are the only people that do this. So I'm convincing my small child to dive into the water where she knows she can't breathe. She's like, dad, dad, no, no. And I'm like, you can do it. It's going to be awesome. And finally, she like dived in. And uh, for the next hour and a half, all we did was jump off the side of the pool because she realized this is awesome. This is so much fun. And when you can learn to channel that mindset, when you can learn to channel the verse, voices in the right way, it will push you to do things that you never thought you were capable of. And so over the next few weeks, I want to talk about in a spiritual sense, how do we channel the right voices in our head? How do we, how do we ignore the wrong ones? And how do we channel the right ones to take control over our lives so that we can start living the God-purposed life that he created us for? I think we're living in a time where we've allowed the wrong voices. And, and I'm not just speaking to here. I'm saying humanity as a whole. I, I think we are crippled under the wrong things in our lives, the wrong voices. They control us. They hold us back. They tell us we're not good enough. They tell us we can't do it. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to be going through Scripture. And, and we're going to be talking about the promises of who God says you are, who, who God created you to be. And there's going to be four specific confessions that we're going to talk about. And these are the things I want you to write down. Because I think these will be powerful for, for those of you with kids. When your kids are waking you up at five in the morning and all you want to do is sleep and your house is a mess and there's boogers on the wall and like all kinds of craziness. These are the promises you remind yourself in that moment when you're like just shoveling down coffee to stay sane. These are the things when you go to work and you're just getting blasted by everybody. These are the promises you tell yourself that will help you remember who God made you to be. And so the first one today, uh, the first confession of this series is God says I am. God says I am. And, and this morning I want to talk about the idea of overcoming insecurity in our lives. Overcoming the voice of insecurity, I think the first voice that we struggle with most of the time is I'm not good enough. I don't care who you are, what age you are in this room, grandparent, high schooler, it does not matter. I think the voice of insecurity will cripple you and it will hold you back from that purpose 
And this morning, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah, because if there was anybody who understood the voice of the struggle of insecurity, if there was anybody who understood what it was like to battle insecurity, it was the prophet Jeremiah. A couple things about Jeremiah, if you're not familiar with the story, and as you're turning there, Jeremiah 1 is where we're going to be. A couple things about Jeremiah is Jeremiah was commissioned by God to preach in one of the most civil unrest times in Israel's history. The the government, the, the structure was in complete disarray, and God calls Jeremiah, a young boy, to go and be a prophet to Israel. His, his message was almost rejected by every single person that, that he spoke to. Jeremiah was not accepted in his town. People did not like the message he was bringing. They did not want him around. It's not like Jonah where he didn't want to go. People did not want him there. Everyone, his own people, foreigners, Jeremiah was rejected. He was not a fan favorite right? He, he was the guy that nobody liked, right? He's like Draymond Green. Like nobody likes Draymond Green. And uh, <laughs> someone in here probably likes Draymond Green. But, uh, but, but, but he was not, he was like Charles Barkley back in the 90s. Nobody liked Charles Barkley. He can look nice on TV now, but he was a jerk. And so Jeremiah wasn't a jerk, but people just did not like him. He lived in isolation, so he didn't have friends, right? He was lonely. People didn't want to be around him. His own family family and friends, they they did not like him. He was persecuted. And in all earthly accounts, he was completely unsuccessful. If we would measure Jeremiah's life by our our earthly standards, you know, how many people got saved, how many people's lives were transformed, we would look at Jeremiah's life and say he was a complete failure in his ministry. We're in an age where, like, the metrics are attendance and, and all these things. Like, you're a successful church if you have this many people. And, and if you save this many, Jeremiah had none of that. He was completely unsuccessful in all earthly accounts. And so with that context to Jeremiah's life, God's words to him in Jeremiah 1 hold a lot more weight, right? There's a lot more value. And and I tell you all that because when we read these verses, especially the verse today that's our passage, uh, it's a very popular verse that people love to throw around. And and it makes you feel really good. But but if you understand the, the promise that was spoken to Jeremiah, you understood why he stuck it out right? Someone who, who walked through all those things, even me, I'd be like, I'm done. Like, God, send someone else. I'm out. Like, I don't want to, like, isolation. Everyone hates me. Like, I'm a failure. Like, I don't want to do this. Like, send somebody else. But if you understand the promise in Jeremiah 1, you understood how he could get through it, the huge significance of it. So, Jeremiah 1, verse 4, it says this, The Lord gave Jeremiah a message, and he said, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet for the nations. How many of y'all have heard that verse before, right? It's on every, like, Christian thing. You could go to Kroger right now and find it on, like, 12 cards. It's a, super, it's a super popular verse, like every baby dedication, all like church loves to throw it out. But there is a significance to this that I think is important for us when we're dealing with voices, because I believe Jeremiah struggled. If you read the book of Jeremiah, he even laments, like, God, where are you? Why did you send me here? And so why would he keep going back? And it's because he understood where his approval came from. He knew the right voice to listen to. And I think Jeremiah, as he struggled continuously, would always fall back to this promise. It's like Abraham, right? Abraham knew what God called him to do. And so he would fall back into this position. And so when Jeremiah is struggling, he he falls back into Jeremiah 1. And he remembers what God said about him. He remembers the promise that was given to him. He understood it. He knew what had been spoken over his life. And I believe that we have the same promise today. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't feel very much like Jeremiah, but I believe God has spoken the same promise over every one of our lives today. And, and, I, and I think it's important for us to understand it. So as we're dealing with the voice of insecurity, the first thing that we need to know, the first thing that I want you to take away is insecurity will rob you from the joy of walking in your purpose. 
Insecurity will rob you. It'll steal the joy of your purpose. As a parent, when you feel insecure and you feel like I'm a failure as a mother or a father, insecurity will rip away the joy of parenthood. I joked about it last week. I said, some of y'all prayed for kids before you had them, and now you'd pray that they would just like stay quiet, right? And I'm like, you asked for the joy of parenthood. You begged God for it. Now you're getting, right? You're reaping what you've sown, right? And I think we forget the joy of being a parent, the joy in those moments, because the insecurity will rob you of that. It'll rip it away. Anybody love the movie Rudy? We, we, I played the, no one loves Rudy. Does anyone know? Who doesn't know what the movie Rudy is? Oh my gosh, come on. What the heck? These are like sports classics. Kayla's like shaking her head up here. Rudy is one of the greatest sports movies ever made. And there's a clip from the movie I want to play this morning because he, he understood the struggle of insecurity. So let's play it real quick. If you can turn it up. Too. Make sure the top's ready. We'll check with the weather service by five, and we'll make a decision then. Hey, 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 hey. What you doing here? Don't you have practice? Not anymore. I quit. Oh. Well, since when are you the quitting kind? I don't know. I just don't see the point anymore. So you didn't make the dress list? There are greater tragedies in the world. I wanted to run out of that tunnel for my dad to prove to everyone prove that I worked. What? That I was somebody. Oh, you are so full of crap. You're five feet nothing, a hundred and nothing, and you got hardly a speck of athletic ability. And you hung in with the best college football team in the land for two years. And you're also going to walk out of here with a degree from the University of Notre Dame. In this lifetime, you don't have to prove nothing to nobody except yourself. And after what you've gone through, if you haven't done that by now, it ain't going to never happen. Now go on back. I'm sorry I never got you to see your first game in here. Hell, I've seen too many games in this stadium. I thought you said you never saw a I've game. I've never though. seen a game from the stands. You were a player? I rode the bench for two years. Thought I wasn't being played because of my color. I got filled up with a lot of attitude. So I quit. Still not a week goes by, I don't regret it. And I guarantee a week won't go by in your life. You won't regret walking out, letting them get the best of you. You hear me clear enough? If you, if you don't know the story of Rudy, it's a true story. Um, played at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, from a small age, if you've seen the movie, you know this. He, he was, uh, his family was a football family, but he was too small. He was too scrawny. So when they would play football, it starts off with him as a kid. He would get left out of the game. They would say, like, Rudy, you can't play. You're no good. And so his whole life, he grows up with this dream of playing football at Notre Dame. His best friend dies. And, and right before he dies, he buys him this Notre Dame jacket, and he goes to Notre Dame. And so he goes to Notre Dame finds out his, he's not smart enough, his grades aren't good enough to get in, no matter how hard he tries. I think he has dyslexia in the movie, if I'm correct. And uh, he, he has a learning disability, and so uh, he, he does all this work, and finally he walks onto the practice squad of Notre Dame, and he just gets beat up every day, like smashed into the ground. Like, this isn't remember the Titans where they're great football players. This is like, you're a horrible football player. Uh, you should not be out here. But he has this determination, and the coach keeps him around, and he just gets beat up and beat up and beat up and finally he gets into Notre Dame a, a priest helps him and tutors him and he gets into the school and uh, he, he's still on the practice squad and he gets to his senior year and his dream is to dress and he goes home for holidays and his parents don't even believe he plays for Notre Dame like his own parents and they, they laugh at him they say he'll never do it he's a failure much like Jeremiah right like you're no good you're, you stink at being a prophet go find something else to do 
you missed your calling. And so he goes through it and through it and through it and finally gets to his senior year and he's hoping to dress one game to prove everybody I played for Notre Dame. He won't ever go down on the roster unless he dresses one game as being a part of the team. His motivation was to prove everybody wrong. And, and, and he goes through this moment where he doesn't make it and he's going to quit. And he's standing in the scene you just saw. And, and, and he goes back from that scene and, and he says, it doesn't matter what everybody says. He listens to the voice of his mentor. And he goes back and, and, and the movie is awesome. It's so good. I'm getting excited. I'm going to go home and watch it today before the Super Bowl. <laughs> and uh, he goes back and, and, and he says, I don't care. I'm gonna, he walks onto the field, the practice squad. Everybody thought he was done. He had every right to quit. And after practice, every player walks in. The, the, these like all American, the best players in the country lay their jerseys down on the coach's desk and say, Rudy can take my place. Rudy can take my place. He ends up dressing a game. And he goes down and get in a tackle. He, he has an amazing game he plays for the team. And he gets carried off the field at the end of the game. All the good feel-good feelings. And I think of that story, and I think as, as it parallels with the life of Jeremiah, Rudy could have given up. He had every right to quit. Everybody didn't believe in him. His own family, friends, everybody said, you're no good. But, but if he would have given up on everything that he had worked for for all those years, he would have missed the moment of glory in the game. And I think how often in our lives are we battling with insecurity and we give up too early instead of pushing through with perseverance and we compromise the moment of glory God has for us. Jeremiah goes down as a great prophet, not because of what he achieved, not because of what he did, not because of his accomplishments, but because of his perseverance. God told Jeremiah that he knew him, that he handpicked him, that, that for this time he was created. God didn't say he picked him uh, because Jeremiah proved himself. I think sometimes we look at God and we say like, well, God picked this pastor because he's a good preacher, or God picked this woman because she can speak good, or she's organized or her life's not chaotic. And nowhere in the Bible does God pick people on their merits. What Jeremiah 1 tells us is that he picks you before you were even born. He gave you a purpose before you even breathed your first breath of air. He knew who you were. And God chooses Jeremiah before he was born, before he could do anything to merit his acceptance. Jeremiah spent his whole life only to be met by rejection, but he was never robbed of his purpose. And I think how often, if we can grab a hold of that idea, it doesn't matter what you accomplish or what earthly things you think you, you deserve or how good you are. If you know your purpose, it doesn't matter about merit. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't matter to work hard and try to be good. I, I think there's an excellence that God calls us to. But, but we are not defined by our merits, by, by how good we are. And so it's so important to understand Jeremiah 1 because God kneels down in that moment and he handpicks Jeremiah. He knew Jeremiah's faults. He knew what Jeremiah was going to walk into. He knew that he would be met with rejection but God bends down and he picks him and he picks each of us. And I think we need to grab a hold of this promise. He bends down and he picks you. He says, I want you. He says, you're mine. He says, I've chosen you. These are all biblical promises. He says, you belong to me. You can, you can know always and will always be known. I have known you since before you were born. These are the promises of scripture that God has already spoken over your life. That your merits don't matter. Your insecurities don't matter. But you've been picked by the creator of the universe. The second thing is, is when you know who he is, God, when you know who he is, then, then, then you know who you are. So, so when I know who God is, I know who I am. My identity isn't in what I accomplished. My identity isn't in my merits. My identity is in the one who gave me life. I was recently at Chick-fil-A. Anybody know Justin, the, the operator of Chick-fil-A? Uh, I was at Chick-fil-A, and, and we were hanging out, and Justin's wife and all their kids were in there, and we were talking. And, and I started laughing because uh, his son, his, like, 
I, I, I can't remember. I think the youngest is like seven, six or seven. And we're hanging out, and he just goes like strolling back behind the counter, right? Like they're running in the middle of lunch, and he's like going back, grabbing like toys and hanging out. And I'm like, dang, wonder what it's like to be a Chick-fil-A owner's kid, right? You just grab some nuggets right out of the fryer and just go to town. I'm like, that sounds awesome. I'm like, I need a parent that owns a Chick-fil-A. And, uh, and so I was watching his kid, but I was laughing, and nobody even questioned this six-year-old walking around behind the counter. Why? Why? Because they know who his daddy is, right? He knows. He doesn't question himself. He doesn't walk back there, like, timid and nervous, like, oh, gosh. He just walked back, like, yeah, I'm I'm a boss. I'm going to own this Chick-fil-A one day. Like, I'm my daddy's son. And he walks back, and he's, he's just taking stuff. I want an ice cream cone. I want French fries. And, and, and you can be like, man, that kid's going to be spoiled, right, all the Chick-fil-A. But, but I think there's a better message. The better message of that story is that when you know who your identity is in, when he knows what his last name is, right? He knows who he is. When you know who your dad is, you know who you are. And I think the same thing is true about God. It's not about entitlement. It's not about trying to get more. But when you understand your position, when you understand the power of your daddy, you understand that that power is then passed to you. You carry that name. You carry that priesthood. Your security isn't in what you can or can't do. Your security is found in the name that is written upon you. You have the thumbprint of God on your life. Someone needs to hear that this morning. Someone needs to hear that you are marked by the breath of the creator. The thumbprint of God, the DNA of who he is, is written inside of you. And I think one of the greatest confessions you can speak over your life is God says, I am blank. You can fill the blank with whatever you want. What's your insecurity? What's, what are you struggling with? When you can begin to fill that blank with the promises of Scripture, and the Bible has tons of them, you, you, begin to, you begin to get puffed up. When you can say, God says I am his masterpiece. God says I am his workmanship. God says I am established. God says I am sealed with his promise. God says I am redeemed. When you begin to speak these things over your life, when you begin to dig into his word and fill your life with the promises of who you are, it eternally stamps you with his glory. You understand your purpose. Even Jesus understood this in Matthew chapter 3, right? This is the Son of God, right? He knows who he is. He knows who his daddy is. And he goes to to the Jordan River, right? And he goes to John to the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, I should be baptizing you. You're the Son of God. And he says, no, baptize me. And, And he gets baptized in the river. And it says this in verse 16. After his baptism, Jesus came up from the water, and the heavens opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like like a dove and settled on him. This is the point. This is the most important thing because even God understood that even Jesus needed to know who he was. It says, a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And the same promise that God spoke over his child, he speaks over you. He looks at your life and he says, this is my son This is my daughter. You bring me joy. You're perfect. You're a masterpiece. I I couldn't have made you any better. Even in your shortcomings, even in, in what you see as a weakness, I see as a strength. Jesus understood he was loved. And, and he isn't confused. He, he isn't, God isn't like looking and saying, he, he knows when he looks at your life and, and, and he says, Tyler, you are perfect and wonderfully made. You have no faults. I designed you to, to impact this world for the kingdom of heaven. He, he's not confused with someone else. He knows exactly who he's talking to. He's speaking over your life. It's a promise. It's a voice that you can lean into. See, I think one of the main reasons we struggle with insecurity in our lives, and, and, and this is where I want to drive this thing home this morning. I think the main reason is a culture We battle insecurity. We get beat up over insecurity. We wrestle with it. Some of you woke up this morning and your first thought wasn't, I'm a child of God. It was, I'm a mess. 
Like, I just want to stay in bed. Like, I don't even want to get out of bed. Like, the sun's out. I don't even care, right? Like, you start listing off all the problems of who you are. And I think the number one reason we struggle with insecurity is we're comparing our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. I want you to think about that. How often do we go through life and, and we look at everyone else's highlights and you get home and you're like just trying to conquer bedtime, right? Or you're just trying to get through the work day with a smile on your face or you're just trying to get through school. And, and so you're looking at everyone else's Instagram story, right? Like, oh man, they got it so together. Look how good they are. And you're like, my life doesn't look like that, <laughs> right? My house is a mess. Like, my life is a mess. My car is a mess. Like, and we're comparing all of our insecurities, all of the, our, our real true life with everyone else's highlight reel. I, I, this week, I had this moment, and I laughed about it as I was writing my sermon. My son has discovered uh, Kanye West's Sunday service album, and I'm totally fine with it. I never thought in my entire life I would let my kid listen to Kanye West at seven years old. But I do, because he's, he's like, On God's my favorite song, Dad. I just like how the beat makes me feel. And I'm like, all right, that's cool. Like, you, you do it. And so he, he, I put an Amazon Echo in his room, and he's super stoked on it and because uh, and, uh, he can listen to his music now. And so I, was, he, I told him, I'm like, if we're sleeping, you're not allowed, because I know I'll hear, like, check for there. And like, he'll be, like, going hard in his room, and I'm like, I just want to sleep. And so I, I put this Echo in here, and he came into my room. We had woken up in the morning before school, and he's like, Dad, can I put on, can I put on Kanye now? And I'm like, Okay, like again, every time I just laugh about it. We were in the car last night and he's just rocking out. I'm like, you just listen to the good Kanye albums. And, uh, and so I, I, I'm walking out of my room and he's like, he's, praise God, when your kids get old enough, they can dress themselves. Anybody excited about that? So he's in his room dressing himself. I don't have to worry about it. I'm like, go get some clothes on and don't look like a scrub. And so he's in there getting dressed and, and all of a sudden I hear like, I hear on God just like bumping in his room. And, uh, and so I'm like, okay. And then he puts on Chick-fil-A and I, and I walk by and he's got, got his shirt off. And he's like rocking out like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I don't know where you learned all this. But he's like going in on Kanye West right now. And so I get my phone out because that's what parents do. You Instagram your children. They're going to hate us one day for it. And so uh, I start Instagramming him. And as I'm recording the video, I realize there is a mountain of dirty laundry in the bottom of the shot. Like underwear, everything. And it, the video was amazing. Like he was going, some of y'all saw the actual video I posted. The first one was way better. You know what I did because of that dirty laundry? I deleted the video and re-recorded it. I, 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 got a, I, I got a less good moment. I compromised the good moment because I wanted my highlight reel to look better. And I think we look at people's lives and we look at the good moments that they maybe have done three or four takes on, right? We, we, we walk into people's houses and we look at what people have and we say, oh man, if I could only have that or if I could have this, I'm not good enough. I don't make enough money. I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not smart enough. I'm what, whatever it is. And we're looking at people's highlight reels. We're looking at their third or fourth take and we're saying my first take isn't good enough. Like, it doesn't compare and, and I think we start this comparison game where, where, where our insecurities start to creep in. And, and, and I just think, as I was laughing about this video even, stupid Kanye video of my son, I said, what do I have to prove? I got two kids. Like, of course I got dirty laundry. Like, there's dirty laundry all over my house right now. If you come over on a Sunday morning, it's a wreck. Like, wh what do I have to prove? Why am I putting myself under this weight of insecurity just to prove something because of dirty laundry? And we miss authentic moments because of a fabricated reality. And this is the culture we live in. And so it's no surprise that people struggle with depression. It's no surprise that people are crippled on, on, under, under anxiety. Because we're trying to be something God didn't design us to be. 
We're trying. I, I can't be Alan. I can't be Tyler. I can't be Clara. I have to be Brent. I have to be the child of God that he made me to be. And I can't examine my life to someone else's highlight reel. I, I can't examine. I can't disqualify myself because, because I'm impatient, right? God made me impatient, but I'm not defined by my impatience right? I'm not defied by my impatience. I'm not defined by whatever shortcomings I have in my life. And, and you need to hear me this morning. I'm over three minutes. I don't care. You need to hear me. You are perfectly made regardless of your behind the scenes. Your behind the scenes is perfect in God's eyes. He made you exactly how you are. He still picks you regardless of it. He still picks you regardless of your, your shortcomings, regardless of your strength. God says you are so much more than your defects or flaws. God has placed you regardless of what your mind tells you. Whatever view uh, you have of yourself, God says you are perfect. In Christ you are made way more. In Christ you are made whole. This is the most important thing. The nature of your calling does not indicate God's level of approval for you. If you're in this room, whatever you feel like your, your calling is or how good you are, it has nothing to do with God's approval. And the fact that other people are more gifted or have different gifts or opportunities, it doesn't diminish the intensity of God's intentionality about the things he created you to do. God made you for a purpose. If you're a teacher, we got a few teachers in this room and you feel like I walk into my room and I have no control, right? I would not, you could not pay me to have your job ever, ever. I go into my son's class and I tell him every time, the first thing I say to him, I say, Mr. Lumpkins, I pray for you every day because I do not want your job. You can give me $500,000 a year, I'd go crazy, right? Some of you are like, you can give me $500,000 a year, I'll do whatever. <laughs> but <laughs> you'd go crazy too at some point. And you might walk in and feel like I'm a failure. I can't even keep 20 kids. Like, God, you, you told me to do this. Like, I'm not qualified for this. And God says, it doesn't matter. I called you. Walk in obedience. Be intentional in what I created you to do. Do not be defined by your insecurities. See, when we confirm God, God's calling on our lives, when we learn to affirm our identity in him, and that's so important, it's a daily choice to wake up and affirm who God created you to be. We activate our identity. We activate who God made us to be. We refuse the lies and we begin to walk in truth. And so there's a few things I'm going to put up on the screen. And if you want to take a picture of it or write it down, these are promises. And, you know, uh, with, this is stuff that, this isn't like a come to the altar and, and your, like your insecurities are gone. This is a daily choice to wake up and say, I am perfectly and wonderfully made. I am a child of God. It's a daily struggle. It's a daily choice. And so there's a few things I want to end this with. God doesn't say we ignore our shortcomings. We acknowledge them, and that's okay. But we don't lean into the shortcoming. We lean into the promise. And so we say things like, I don't like myself very much today in this moment. I've said this to myself a lot. I say this. I say, I, I, I don't like myself very much in this moment. I'm not, I'm not lying. I, I'm being a jerk. I don't like who I am. I'm impatient. But I know that I am loved, right? I don't like myself, but I know that the Father loves me. I don't seem to be gaining much momentum in my life in this battle that I'm facing, but I know I'm more than a conqueror. I don't have a lot of confidence in myself right now. Some of y'all need to write that on your mirror, write this on your wall, like tattoo it down your arm. I don't really care. I don't have a lot of confidence in myself right now, but I know I am strong and courageous. All of these are biblical promises that God has said. I don't know how to fix this part of my life. Some of you are lost mentally. And some of you need to say, I don't know how to fix this part of my life, but I am healed and whole. Right? 
That's the song John sang, like we didn't even plan it. But that's the song he sang. He sang miracles this morning. That song was written out of one of the darkest place, places in, in that man's life. He just lost a child. In, earthly, in, in all earthly standards, God didn't come through. His baby died. And when you can say, I don't know how to fix this. I don't, I don't know how to make it right. I don't know how to climb out of this hole. But I know that I'm healed and I'm made whole. You begin to lean into those promises. You begin to walk in truth. Your identity isn't found in your secure, insecurity. Your identity is found in your promise. Your struggle isn't defined by the insecurity. Your struggle is defined by the promise. Some of y'all need to start defining your lives by the promise of God. And you need to move past. You don't need to post how broken you are on Instagram. You don't need to post how, how messed up your life is. You don't need to sit down at every meeting you have and just unload on people. You don't need to go there because you know you were perfectly and wonderfully made right? You, you, don't, you don't need to lament 24-7. Jeremiah was a mess. And there are moments where he cries out to God and says, God, why, why, why did you do this to me? This isn't fair. I don't want it. But he doesn't spend all the pages of the book of Jeremiah just whining and complaining about his life because he knows who God called him to be in Jeremiah 1. He spent his life building his foundation on the promise of who God said he was. Let's be a church. Let's be a people that build our life on our promises and not on our failures. Let's look at authentically at our lives and say, God, make me holier. God, make me better. God, I want to move past this area, but I know who I am. I'm not defined by this anymore. Decide daily to lean into who he is, who he made you to be. Surround yourself with prayer warriors. Surround yourself with people that you can talk to. I'm not, I'm not saying don't, don't ever ask people for help or don't ever talk through things. Surround yourself people that, with people that will make you better, that will push you closer to holiness. But make a daily decision to wake up. If you want to put those up one more time, Scott. Make a daily decision to speak these things, the words of God over your life. Decree it. Declare it. Know it's true. Right? If God's word is the foundation for our life, if it's his holy word written for us, if it's a gateway into the heart of who God is, if that's how we know him better, then we need to lean on those words, his promises of who he says he is. It'll transform your life. It'll give you a purpose when you climb out of bed, when you know that you're loved when you know that you're a conqueror, when you know that you're strong, when you know that you're healed. Man, you can, you can climb out of anything, right? It's like Justin's kid rolling through Chick-fil-A. I'll get as many chicken nuggets as I want because I know who I am. My prayer is as we dig into this, you begin to find a strength in your heart, a strength in your life, a wholeness in who God made you to be. And so let's stand to worship this morning. I told John I wanted to end these services like, man, I want to, I want to worship. I want to decree some things. And so we're going to worship this morning. We're going to lift up God's name. We're going to praise him. Some of y'all, Scott, you can leave that up for a, a few minutes and then we can switch to the lyrics. But some of y'all just need to pray some of those things over your life right now. Right now. We don't need to, you don't need me to lead you. Just start beginning to pray those things over your life. Thanking God for who he is. Thanking God for who he made you to be. Asking God to give you strength. Asking God that, that you would feel loved. Some of y'all need to lean into the arms of Christ this morning. God, we thank you for who you are. God, we praise you that you're holy. God, that you pr we praise you. God, we thank you that we are perfectly and wonderfully made in your eyes. God, that you have called us for a purpose. God, God, that you knitted us together. God, you know the hairs on our head. You know who exactly who we are. God, you designed us for such a time as this. God, I pray that callings would be renewed. God, that purposes would begin to lift up. God, that people would find a confidence in who they were made to be. God, that they would find a purpose in who you called them to be. God, that they would walk and they would be the light of Christ. God, that they would not cast shadows, but they would cast light. God, that that anxiety would begin to fall off. That 
that depression would begin to fall off. God, that brokenness, God, that you, you would begin to knit people's hearts together, that they would find a wholeness in who you made them to be. And so, God, we praise you this morning. We lift you up. We give you all the glory. We thank you that you're a loving God. You're a God that calls us and declares things over our lives. So, God, in Jesus' name, we lift up your name in our praises, with our voices, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would well?